What do you usually picture when you think about a banjo? Do you think about the Appalachian Mountains or the, the countryside of the U.S. South? Maybe an image of a white man in overalls, no shoes, picking and grinning. I mean, these are all the things that I thought about my whole life with the banjo. The journey is complicated, but it is super illuminating about how America came to be. I didn't grow up knowing any of this history that I'm gonna be telling you about. I knew none of it. I knew what I suspect most people watching this knew, that the banjo was a white hillbilly instrument that sort of came in and then became sort of a comedic you know, idea in the hands of like Steve Martin and lots and lots of jokes. And that's what I grew up with as the banjo and the sound, that real tinny kind of exciting, trebly, very, very, piercing sound. That's what I knew of the banjo. And so all of this changed when I became an adult. I went to this, what I thought was an English country dance, but actually it was a contra dance. And I find out later that the contra dance is the American descendant of the English country dance. And I got hooked. I got hooked to the idea of live music and folk dancing. Now here's where the contact is. In my region, in the Piedmont of North Carolina, which is where I'm from, the woman who was putting on these dances, Carol Thompson, she loved old time music. Now, old time music was something that I had never really heard. I'd heard bluegrass, which is kind of what I think a lot of people think of when they think of the banjo, that really fast, you know, very exciting sound. Old time was a little bit more funky. It was a little bit more relaxed. It was a little bit more for dancers. And so that's the bands that she would book for these dances, these really rhythmic, funky, there was always somebody on the banjo, somebody on the upright bass, somebody playing fiddle and just playing these really cool tunes. And I was dancing to this music every week going, oh my gosh, now I've never heard the banjo sound like this. The rhythm was different. It just felt like, I don't know, I could feel it in my soul in a different way than bluegrass music. And I became hooked to the sound of the claw hammer banjo, which is what people play in old time. And I was really, really connecting to it. And I realized that I wanted to play it. It wasn't enough to dance to it. And so I got a second job and I bought, you know, a, a cheap banjo, my first Deering banjo, and also a fiddle, because I wanted to learn everything. I was just fascinated with this music. And as a vocalist, I had never really learned instrumental music. And so it was a huge mountain to climb, but I was like so ready for it. And so I was starting to learn this music and trying to find teachers. And then I would call, I would go to the, uh, the old time jams, you know, of the community of people who played the music in the Piedmont of North Carolina. And of course, as time kind of went on, the elephant in the room was that I was the raisin in the oatmeal. You know, I was usually the only uh, person of color in the room, you know, usually 99% of the time it was just me. And I just started to kind of feel a little bit like, I don't know, I felt like I had to ask permission to be in this music, you know? And I was kind of like, you know, you guys let me in. Everybody was so nice and they're so welcoming. They're coming in and look, I'm like half white. Like I, should, I shouldn't have felt any of that, but I did feel it because there's this idea that this music is kind of the preserve of a certain area, like the Appalachian Mountains and the white people who live in those mountains and it's their music. And so I kind of felt like I needed to kind of ask permission to get in there. But then stuff started to happen. Like I started seeing, you know, Marshall Wyatt's uh, label he has, and he had these CDs that had like black musicians on the cover playing old time music. And I was like, what's that? And so I was like, oh, black people did play this music. That's amazing. And then I was referred to Cece Conway. People in the community going, have you talked to Cece? She wrote this book. And the book is called African Banjo Echoes in Appalachia. And that blew my mind because that's the moment when I found out that the banjo is actually an African-American invention. They also pointed me to a really important person. He became a very important person in my life, a man named Joe Thompson, who was an actual living proponent of black string band music. He was a fiddler and he'd been playing this music since he was five years old and he lived in Mebane, 
North Carolina, which is where my family's from. I used to go down there for family reunions every year. Did not know he existed. And he was 86 when I first met him. And that changed my life. Why these six banjos? We start with the beginning, you know, the banjo that people were creating themselves in the Caribbean, which becomes known as the gourd banjo or a gourd banjo. And everything that surrounds the creation of that is in the DNA of everything that follows. So we have to start there, right? And then we have the traveling of the banjo from the black culture to white culture, from uh, homemade instrument to commercial instrument. So we have then the minstrel banjo. And everything that happens during that transition is in the blueprint of what follows, right? And then we have a continuance of the black playing of the banjo through jazz, but it's something that's not really well known. And it's going through an incredibly important piece of transition for American culture, you know, at the turn of the century. So made sense to have the tenor banjo in there. And then you think about what the banjo means to people and the chameleonic nature of the instrument, how, you know, different folks can find themselves in that instrument. So it made sense to go to the Irish banjo because that's something you didn't see coming, right? And then we think about the obvious place of the banjo has been in bluegrass and old time and country music and what happens with the narrative and how it changes from being known as a black instrument to being known, everybody knows that it's a white instrument. So we had to include that. And then you get to, well, where are we today with the banjo? You know, there's all of these things that are happening now that connect us all the way back to the beginning. And so the more that I started to learn about the history that surrounds where the banjo comes from, the more American culture of right now started to make sense to me. You know, why is the banjo popular over here? Why is the banjo being brought over here? Why does the banjo look like this? Why does the music and the musician holding the banjo look like that? I'm part of a team of people who want to make sense out of American history, and we include all of the different sides of it. So when we step back, we actually get more of a 3D model rather than a 2D piece of paper. Well, I'm absolutely delighted you guys could join me today. I cannot believe I'm lucky enough to be able to sit here at this table and talk to all of you at once. Um, Because, you know, we have here an instrument maker, an author and well, everyone's a researcher. And then, you know, Greg, we've been talking through performance practice and, you know, looking at the music. Um, so we're just gonna be talking about the work that you guys are doing and, and how it's intersecting with what I'm trying to do with this idea that the banjo has came into being as a ritual sacred object of the African diaspora. As we've, I think we all agree, like, looking at this history, there's there's something of genesis moments for our cultural history that go back to this these early this early banjo history. And as Americans, this is the cultural air we still breathe all the time. And we just have a responsibility to know it. And I sort of can't help myself. I just, I want to know the truth of this stuff and I just want to keep digging at it. And even when it gets into some really hard truths, you know, I feel it's it's my responsibility to look at this stuff. There was a point in time where people knew that the banjo was this instrument of the African diaspora and they knew that it had this religious component, you know, that it was a religious object. Thinking about the banjo and all of the beautiful and powerful things that can come out of people coming together, nurturing one another, learning how to do something. The flip side is, in order to really understand that history, 
we have to understand America's history of slavery. We have to understand how these things fit into America's first major forms of popular music through the phenomenon of blackface minstrelsy. And then we also need to understand how all of this material that survives to this day, how does it fit into these larger industrial motions to capitalize and commercialize what's going on? All of these identities, all of these experiences, all of these cultural tools and implements are embedded in these very challenging things that we all need to figure out more pathways. How do we talk about this? At the first black banjo gathering in Boone, North Carolina in 2005, and yes, there was such a thing, it was incredible, there were two West African players. One was an Ingoni player from Mali, whose name was Sheikh Kamala Jabate. The Akonting player, Daniel Jata, was from the Gambia and he lived in Sweden. Now watching him play and talk about the Akonting, I was immediately struck by the similarities of the playing styles of the Akonting and the old time banjo. Now, Daniel says that the word banjo comes from banjo, B-A-N-G-O-E, a Mandinka word. And the Gambia's capital, banjul, also comes from this word. Now, there's a lot of theories as to where the word banjo comes from, but just the fact that there is a cultural story from that area, it means everything to me. The Akonting is thought to have originated in Southwest Senegal. Now, with a round or oval gourd body, looks like a drum, it's got a stick neck and it has three strings. Two are long and they're the melody strings and one is the short drone string. So the banjo isn't necessarily from Africa. It wasn't invented in Africa, but it starts even before Africa, the idea of it, because you have instruments that come all the way from the Far East, they move into the Middle East, they go down into Africa and they go up into Europe and they change wherever they go. They're changing as they travel with people. They're being changed by where they end up. So you have this really big family of stringed instruments that are all kind of related. And you have different versions in different places. So you have these gourd and calabash type lutes that already exist in Africa before people were ever brought over as part of the transatlantic slave trade. So when folks were brought over as enslaved people to the Caribbean in particular, these memories of these instruments, even if not the instruments themselves, I'm not sure exactly how many may have come over with people, but at least the idea and the knowledge of how to make these instruments came with these people. And in the Caribbean, the idea of the banjo started to come together because you have all these people from different places and it, and it starts to coalesce in the Caribbean and become known as the banjo, the banza, the, all these different terms that become the banjo as time goes on. From the beginning of the transatlantic trade in human beings, Europeans wrote about this act of music instrument creation as they saw it on the ships, in the Caribbean, and beyond. So banjo researcher Laurent Dubois describes how in 1819, the British architect Benjamin Latrobe, who was the second architect of the U.S. Capitol, sketched an instrument with the body of a calabash, which he saw being played by black performers in New Orleans. Now, this was after 100 years of the instrument already being played in the Caribbean and in Afro-Atlantic communities. Dubois's book, The Banjo, America's African Instrument, explains that the banjo was, quote, not just for the enslaved to gather with one another across ethnic lines, but also to connect with ancestors and gods. Its role was not just sonic, but also spiritual. Its sound accompanied funerary rites and wakes, and the musicians who played it occupied roles not just as performers, but as individuals who convoked and channeled the spiritual, end quote. So on the one hand, you have the banjo as the spiritual connection to the very land that these people had been taken from. And then on the other extreme, you have the banjo used as a tool of economic might, right? And this is going to be a pattern that we're going to see the banjo as cultural uh, keystone and the banjo as commercial instrument. So you have people, the enslavers basically, using the ancestors to the banjo, these instruments that existed all over Africa, and the musicians who played them to ensure a healthier cargo because, of course, slavery was all about money. It was all about the bottom line. They would bring these poor people up from the bowels of the ship to the deck for this brief amount of time to dance to this music. And they would make them dance. They would use the lash and they would make them dance so that they would be healthier 
when they got to the other side so that these people had more money. So the other thing that we have to understand about this time period is that people weren't brought directly from Africa to all the different places in the United States. There was a lot of movement through the Caribbean. The Caribbean was kind of a deliberate seasoning process. People died at exponential rates. It was really, really horrible. And it broke people. I mean, it's just, that's just, there's no way around it. And they would bring people there first, and then they would end up in the United States, especially when the transatlantic trade was outlawed. You know, so you can no longer bring people straight from Africa to the United States at a certain point. So there was all this movement through the Caribbean. And what that means is that there was a, an amalgamation of cultural ideas that were happening in an area, and then there was a migration of those ideas with people. And it made me think about how far back this goes. You know, it goes all the way back to Africa in terms of people, in terms of memories, in terms of what came first, and the culture that this music and the need to survive came out of. So this is my gourd banjo. Um, it's not a historical instrument. It wasn't made from you know the, a painting or a picture or anything. But I think it gives you a pretty good idea of what a gourd instrument would have sounded like back then because in basics, it is pretty similar. It's got a wooden neck and this beautiful gourd body. Um, this is called a tack head gourd because uh, a gourd banjo because it is the this is an animal skin that's been put on by tacks. And that was a, a technique that was used you can see the inside there. It's just a really beautiful instrument. And I love the sound of it. Now you can hear that it's much deeper than maybe the modern banjos that um, people are more used to. It's got a, a very resonant sound, a very uh, organic sound. Uh, and I'm playing it in what we call claw hammer style. So this is the back of the nail is used for all of the strokes and the thumb is just used on the drone string. So the hand in general, the hand goes down and then when it comes back up, the thumb plays the drone string. And another difference that the gourd banjo has is that it's a much higher the, string, the, the, the height of the strings is, is higher than the, the modern banjo, so I actually have a lot of give. And the, other, um, the other thing about this instrument that you may have noticed is that it is fretless. So there are no frets that are engraved or placed on this for a very long time. The banjo was fretless until the mid to late 1800s and it was, it had the sound of the in-between for a very long time. And I think that's an important piece of this because when you think about something like an oud, you know, which is, which has all the ability to go in between and have all the microtones and, you know, you're not locked into any one thing. You can do a lot of different stuff. And that's really one of the aspects of the banjo that people don't think about nowadays because they all have frets, but none of them did for a very long time. So you can really, you can, you can really like blue note it up all, all you want. So when you are trying to correct a false narrative, you have to lean in on the piece that has been obscured, the piece that's been hidden. And in this narrative, the piece that's been hidden is the fact that banjo is an African invention. It has African ancestors, and that it was invented by the African diaspora in the Caribbean. That is a big piece of information. And from that piece, there are huge branches of other information that has also been obscured, that has also been erased, but that is very important for our correct understanding of where American culture comes from. There's a lot of people who are invested in this story, and we are creating a community 
that's drawing other people to it. And it's not just about being Black playing the banjo, but also offering up a different point of view. This is just how I see American culture through the development of the banjo. What's important to say here is that this is an inclusionary history. It's not exclusionary. What It's very tempting to hear, oh, it's an African-American mention. That means that it's being taken out of the hands of white people. That's not true at all. It's actually just widening the focus and showing the entire story, which is actually beautiful. The entire story is actually some of the best of where humanity comes together in the midst of some of the worst of what humanity has done, right? Because we cannot talk about the banjo without talking about the institution of slavery, which is why we have the banjo. Mm -hmm. 